Welcome everyone to the Bridging Knowledge Scholarship webinar. Tonight in our series, we have Jonna Payden who's joining us. This scholarship program is sponsored by the IMLS and we are so glad that you were all here to join us. This presentation will be recorded and the recording will be posted to the SJSU YouTube channel and it will also be shared with the Sustainable Heritage Network. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them into chat. And at the end of Jana's presentation, she will be offering time up for Q&A. So we're so glad that you're here. And without further ado, I will let Jana introduce herself. Thank you, Jana. Sure, hi everyone. It is great to see you here. Thank you for coming to the live session. Um, my name is Jonna Payden. I am from Acoma and Laguna Pueblos, and that's the my Pueblo behind me in my background. Um, I titled this um, Responsibility, Representation, and Respect in a Tribal Archives and Library because I hope to show how these three words are my guide for the work that I do. Um, I was raised by my grandparents. I grew up on the Laguna Reservation, but I'm very tied to my Acoma homelands. And I've lived in Albuquerque for, gosh, going on 24 years now. Alrighty, so as you all know, I'm a graduate of San Jose State University. I was part of the second um, circle of learning cohort. Um, my title says librarian and archivist, but I am archives educated and trained. So for my degree, I chose the career path of archives and records management, which really it's the whole title is uh, management, digitization and preservation of cultural heritage and records. So I am in my third year as the chair of Native American Libraries Special Interest Group of the New Mexico Library Association. Um, and I am also the archivist for the NMLA. I am in the, uh, one of the associations I be belong to is the Society of Southwest Archivists and I'm on uh, the committees, the South, I'm um, sorry, Diversity and Outreach Committee and the Publications Subcommittee and the Local Arrangements Committee um, because SSA will be in Albuquerque uh, next year. So I'm excited for that. I've never been able to attend any of the um, those um, conferences. So I'm excited for that one. And I, I, I believe I'll be doing a tour of the cultural center for the group that comes. Uh, another project I was involved with is the School for Advanced Research. We did guidelines for collaboration. Um, this one is guidelines for non-Indigenous museum and archival staff that work that are working with indigenous museum archives and curatorial professionals, cultural leaders and artists. So it's really just advice for um, the, 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 cult, the, the native side, the indigenous side for them, what to expect when you go into a museum, what sort of questions should you ask? What should you be prepared for? So things like, you know, and, and they should on their end tell you, you know, if you're going to be surrounded by certain items um, or, or even like, um, you know, um, skeletal remains and such so that you're aware of those things because culturally maybe in your culture, that's not something you should be around or women shouldn't be around certain types of objects. So it's just kind of advice to help um, the two um both the indigenous people and the non-indigenous um, archive and uh, museum folk be able to work together. So of course on the uh, museum side, we would hope that they would, for whatever information we give them, that they would also share it back with the communities. So here's the cultural center. If you've never been here to visit the center, the picture on the left is one entrance and the picture on the right is the middle. So it's kind of shaped, um, the center was built in 1976. So we're close to celebrating our 50 year anniversary. The original building is a D shape, which is reminiscent of Chaco Canyon. Um, and so the, there's murals all around um, the big walls in there, as well as a lot of artwork, huge artwork, pieces of artwork by Pueblo artists within um, the building. Um, so this new part has um, 
um, meeting rooms for us. So I've been there for um, a total of 20 years. Uh, I started out in the bookstore, which is opposite this picture here. The, the room was opposite this picture. I was in retail for about 11 of those years. So I was on the profit side of the cultural center. We have both a nonprofit and a profit side. And so um, after I had my son, then I became a stay home mom and I was stay home mom for about four years. And then I went back to the center. Well, because in that time, uh, um, 2001 or 2002, I went back to the University of New Mexico. I had started right out of college, but I certainly wasn't ready for, for college. I had bad habits and in high school and that followed me straight through college. So um, I went for about a year and a half and then I, I left. I thought, you know, I'm wasting my grandma's money. I shouldn't <laughs> be wasting her money. So let's, I'll come back at, a, at another time in, in, in later years. And so it took me almost 10 years before I went back to UNM, but I loved it because I got to make my own degree. And so in that time, I thought, well, you know, I love my job. I was doing receiving at that time, um, checking in all the merchandise that we purchased, putting it into a database, um, putting price tags on it, that sort of thing. But I, that wasn't a career. I, that wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And um, so then I happened to come across um, the honoring generations at University of Texas, Austin, and I thought, well, what the heck is a library and information science degree? Um, I found you could become an archivist. And I thought, well, hey, that's, I think that's something I want to do. So then I just happened to find the Circle of Learning program at SJSU and applied and yay, I got in. So, um, okay, so the next photo. I'll tell you all about, all about me as we go along. <laughs> so here's our mission. The mission of the center is to preserve and perpetuate Pueblo culture and to advance understanding by presenting with dignity and respect the accomplishments and evolving history of the Pueblo people of New Mexico. Now the purpose statement, we, the library has a different mission. Oh, that is, I'm sorry. That's the mission statement for the library. No, 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 I, oh, I'm confused here. This is the mission statement for the cultural center. So. Our mission statement is a little bit different, but it relates to the mission statement of the center. So the purpose statement for us is that we reflect we, and support the IPC's mission by collecting and preserving Pueblo history and culture, and to provide informational resources to educate and understand the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico and then the indigenous peoples of North America. And actually there are 20, kind of 21 Pueblos. Um, they, we kind of include the Hopi as a Pueblo because they've been kind of named a Pueblo, but they're kind of not really a Pueblo and they're in Arizona. Um, and there's the Isleta del Sur, which is in El Paso, Texas. Okay, um, next photo, please. So here's a map I thought I'd share of all of the Pueblos that are in New Mexico. So we go from um, Taos Pueblo in the north to Isleta in the south, uh, all the way to Zuni in the west. Um, so uh, there, there are um, 14, I believe, um, 14. There's more tribal libraries. Almost every Pueblo has a tribal library, and but there's more coming every year. And of course, the Navajo Nation has um, that as well as chapter houses. Their main library is in um, Window Rock, but they also have chapter houses um, across um, their um, land base. Okay, next. So here is the entry photo to the the library and archives were located in the basement and every single, well, this is our third move. And I think this, I hope this isn't our final move because I would love to get us above ground to where people can see us and, you know, not be stuck in the basement, but every single entry to the library has been excellent for SWOT analysis, which I'm sure y'all have taken that in the um, Library 101 class, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, um, because we're just not visible. 
And I mean, it's gotten better, but we're still kind of not visible because this little hall area, I lighten the picture. It's kind of dark there. Um, but once you walk in, we've got 40, I think I counted 40, like 44 lamps or, or lights fixtures at the top. And we had um, someone who came through and did a, um, um, an assessment for environmental assessment for the library and archives. And it was crazy. They said that the average, um, the normal light lumens, I think is like 300. And with all of these lights in here, we're at 1800. <laughs> so it's quite bright in there. Um, the bookshelves that you see there, they were donated by the University of New Mexico. And this was just around, you know, we're still kind of in COVID time. So we have the um, plexiglass, um, 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 what do you call in the center there to dividers, dividers in there. Um, so the library has been um, in existence for as long as the center has, but it was often, it was started by um, Dr. Joe Sando, who's from Jemez Pueblo, along with, um, he's a historian and an author, along with a UNM professor and his wife. And up until about 2012, it was managed um, by um, non-librarian volunteers and only open one day a week for limited hours. So as I said, that's one reason I decided to get an MLIS and I thought I would love to get this place open and more visible. Um, and, and so I returned back to the center in 2011 for about a year and a half as a volunteer so I could get familiar with what I would be working with. And I, I had absolutely no experience working in the library or an archive. So that was my opportunity and chance to do so. Um, things worked out because in 2012, um, we got a grant, an Administration for Native Americans grant that helped expand the library, helped purchase um, a lot of the equipment, um, desks, um, computer software, computers, helped pay for three student interns of which I was one and brought on a director to help um, start the library. So that so we moved from the library used to be located right next to a boiler room. So we moved it into a little bit bigger room. And so now this is an even larger room. So um, we are a research library. And so one of my goals has been to make this a welcome environment. So right, you know, doing little things like if you can see on the table there, there's a little tiny plant that I bought like at the dollar store just to give it some color and you know, liven up the table. And there's a few other things I've, I've bought, the bigger plants and whatnot. I put a like a wooden coat rack at the door just, you know, to make it a little bit livelier. And I had one of my friends, um, he does a lot of sewing of traditional um, clothing and whatnot. I asked him to make a like a coffee table scarf because we have um, some old um, card catalogs there. So to cover the top, it's really beautiful. So just little things like that, just to add. Um, I do know they have like clocks with um, the numbers in Keras. So maybe eventually I'll get that. Along the wall, you can just barely see there's a whole row, um, which are the, um, the what's the right word? Um, the, the, like the symbols, the logos of, of each of the Pueblos. So, but they're in black and white and I think I'd like to get those in color. Um, so we're non-lending and we're special collections and research libraries. So we use the Library of Congress cataloging for our classification system. Um, we're focused on Pueblo history, but we also have other Southwest tribes and indigenous peoples across the um, globe, really. Um, a majority of our books are donated. We have a lot of older titles um, that are represent representative of the 1950s to maybe the 1980s, maybe even older, 1930s and such. Um, which I keep in a special collection for research purposes, um, because especially the children's books, because those aren't really books I want children to be reading, but they are great research material for people who might be um, researching, you know, 
um, what representations of us look like, how we were written about, because really it's, you know, on one hand, it's amusing, but on another hand, it's, you know, it's, it's not. <laughs> so, um, so when I was a student intern um, with the administration for Native Americans grant, I was um, an intern for three years. So for the first year, year and a half, I worked on the library side. And one of the things that I was awarded, I wrote a, a grant for the New Mexico to the New Mexico Library Foundation uh, to help purchase some books. Um, and those were children's books. Okay, next slide, please. This is one of our prize collections. It's the theses and dissertations. Um, these were re researched and written by Pueblo scholars from about the 80s on. And if they're not written by Pueblo scholars, they're definitely Pueblo topics. And so we would love to grow this section because we're, you know, getting a lot more um, Pueblo people going to college and, you know, producing dissertations and research. So this is a, definitely a section we would like to grow. Okay, next slide. So this is our children's and juvenile books. So the picture on the left is what any typical library looks like, especially um, I think a research library. So I'm kind of taken from the um, public library side and using colored tabs. So like on the right here, so that the children's um, books are, the, the, their call number has a different color versus the juvenile section, which has a different color, which is helpful for um, our volunteers that help us in the library. It'll help them and us be able to um, bookshelf the books properly. Um, so, and then of course, just taking the books and facing them out to say, you know, well, this is a new book or, um, here's the topic for the month and here's, you know, books on that topic. Um, so just trying to make the bookshelves look more welcoming and inviting and able to browse by, by, you know, shelf because the library of Congress um, system is, is, is really tough. I mean, a lot of my, my classmates kind of laughed at me when I, <laughs> when I took cataloging and classification, because, you know, a lot of places you have the software that will do it for you. But when I structured my MLIS degree, I did it with um, my boss, um, Dr. Rose Diaz, um, who was very helpful in helping me um, navigate this new world of library and information science. She wasn't a, li a librarian, but she did work at the University of New Mexico Library. She was a um, research historian. Um, so she helped me pick a lot of the classes that we thought I would need to run a place like the cultural center. So cataloging and classification was one of those. And I'm so glad I took it because it's helped me learn um, about the Library of Congress subject headings as well as all the things that are wrong with it and the, the issues with it, you know, and the naming, um, you know, to how they're, how we're cataloged and classified. So, um, so what I did here then with the kids section is I broke it up into different um, areas. So there's a people section, as you can see there with Deb Holland, uh, Maria Tallchief and Wilma Mankiller. There's a nation section. So that's gonna be on tribal nations, about tribal nations. There's a section on myths and legends because that's what they call our stories. Um, and then just a general section. So I'd like to extend this kind of um, organization throughout um, the entire um, um, books that we have. Um, so, you know, putting the poetry all in one place because they can't, the literature, sometimes they're in different places because of the way LCC catalogs them by um, location rather than by subject. Uh, putting all the art books together, all of the boarding school education books together. Um, and I'm very well might separate them by nation. Uh, I know we have a donation that came in that's um, primarily books on Alaska tribes. So that's um, what I'd like to do there. 
Okay, so um, I prefer to get, especially with the children's section, um, native authored books. Um, more than half of our books are donated. Um, we have a loan from the Albuquerque Archaeological Society. Uh, most of them are older books. In the children's section, um, such as by Ann Nolan Clark, which were readers, she did a series of readers for um, to be used in Indian schools. Um, but those, as we know, are troublesome for their content, their voice, and their accuracy. So those go into the special um, access. Um, like I said, I don't want kids to be reading books like that about them themselves. Um, and um, there's also books, you know, that have been bought. And I will say that when I worked on the retail side, I was the book buyer. Um, and I'm, I will honestly say I didn't assess every book that I bought. So I know, you know, some of our popular sellers were the Paul Goebel books, which aren't, Debbie Reese will not recommend. <laughs> so I think for those books that are still in here, like those written by Goebel, I would love to get um, articles and be able to put them with the books or put them in a section nearby. So, you know, we can say, well, this is why this book, you know, isn't the best to, to have. Okay, so we also have um, in the special access, we have some restrictics, restricted sections um, for religious and I guess you could just call them cultural tell-alls where you know there's everything written about a tribe or a nation and some of the pueblos are more open than others but because we're all related um, we will respect um, the more traditional pueblos and restrict access to culturally sensitive materials and, um, you know, we've had people come in that ask, um, particularly for like Hopi Kachina books. And um, if they're non-native, we tend to not let them see. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to police what people read. So there's a fine line. And I think we're just still trying to figure that out and what that means and how we enforce that. So that's a work in progress. Okay, next slide. This here is our catalog. We use library theme um, because it, of its low cost, but it certainly has issues. It's not meant um, to be a book catalog. Um, it takes a lot of the information from Amazon and automatically feeds it in there. Um, and I, and, and, and one of the issues was, as I mentioned, the library was run by volunteers, so they didn't understand or weren't aware of library policies, um, how things should be proper, properly put into a catalog. Plus there were, um, as we say, too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, so there's a lot of inconsistencies in our um, in the database. And, you know, as I mentioned, I worked in retail and I um, did entry of um, the inventory. So database is in my background. I had over 10 years of work with databases. So I understand how to, um, how something should work better. So that's what I'm trying to do with this catalog is to improve all of the, um, little glitches and whatnot, and try to work and see how this catalog can work better for us. So next slide, please. So this is an example of one of them. The top one, the Pueblo Nations, that's what an old entry would look like. So it uses a lot of tags, which are not necessarily helpful, you know, when you have um, just the general public naming things, because, you know, well, what, what is, what is, something mean, you know, well, what is land rights? Who's land rights? Those sort of things. So the next um, Thunder Bear and Co, that's one of the, uh, yes, one of the improved tags. So, you know, where I try to be um, conscious of the naming of people. So saying, you know, Tewa Indians instead of a general Indians of North America. Um, but even on that um, kind of labeling, um, when you get Indians of like Indian, let's see, is it here? Indian wars or Indian women. I tend to put 
in brackets, American in front, just to differentiate that, you know, we're talking American Indians. So the nice thing we I've been doing is adding on the reading age and the grade level, just to give readers a general idea of, you know, what grade level that book might be for. Um, and uh, one of the new things I found in library thing is to be able to do um, a collection. So that way they're divided, you know, the children's collection, we have a juvenile collection, a reference, a dissertation and theses, um, the special access, and the, the books that are on loan from the Albuquerque Archaeological Society. Um, so as you'll see on the bottom, the Seening Sioux, um, that's our designation, the um, special access children, um, and then the rest of the call number. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, let me see. So I transitioned from the library in March, March 23rd of 2020, yeah, I was, um, so after I did my stint as a student intern, I was at the cultural center, I, I was a volunteer and then a, and a student intern from 2012 to 2015. And then I came back in 2018 um, as a community intern. Um, Dr. Diaz um, had been, called back to the center because they had a national endowment for the humanities grant. And so I worked uh, with her on an oral history project, which I'll show here in a bit. So when I came, transitioned over to the library um, because the previous librarian before me left, um, took a, a different position. Um, I was alone. Uh, my staff were um, put on furlough and the cultural center closed as we dealt with the COVID. Um, so I worked from home for a bit and then I went back to work, you know, all these dates um, just kind of mesh in my mind. So I can't, can't exactly remember what, when's what. Um, I think I went back into work in November of 2020 for a while and we worked staggered shifts so that, you know, half of the staff was there and the other half was there on different days. So like Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, and so that, so that we didn't have the full staff. And so in that time I decided, well, you know, what can I do to help make the library more visible? And so I started um, this blog, um, doing a monthly library blog. Um, at that time on the nonprofit side, we would have a monthly theme. Um, and so we would try to kind of do the same related content. Um, the nonprofit side includes um, the museum and the curatorial, um, what is what is her title? Um, curator of collections, I believe she is. So she does a view into the collection um, where she talks about her, um, the, the, the items, the objects that we have at the Cultural Center Art art objects. So like, you know, um, in December, I, we would do a storytelling kind of um, theme, and she would talk about storytellers. So that's how I started the library blog. Um, I wanted to inform on contemporary subjects and people, none of this in the past thing. So I stick most a lot to um, contemporary topics. I mean, I'll bring out like um, the Pueblo Revolt, which of course happened in 1680, but, you know, bring it, put, pull in new things, contemporary things to help tell that story. Um, my background, um, okay, so as I said, I went back to the University of New Mexico. I got a Bachelor of University Studies degree, which I was happy I got to create my own degree I did English and under English, I did professional writing and um, uh, native literature. I also focused on linguistics. I did uh, native American languages. Um, I took Navajo for my language class because I figured, hey, I took Spanish in high school. If I'm doing a native studies kind of um, degree, you know, Navajo would be perfect. So certainly would have done my own language had they offered it at UNM, but <laughs> you know, it's not a written language so. Um, my family was 
a little like, what? You're taking Navajo, but hey, you know, I did pretty well. So um, the guy that you see here at the top that I did the interview with, Andrew Thomas, he's Navajo. And he was so impressed with me that I took that class and got an A. I mean, he'll brag about that. Although I always remind him it was an A minus. So <laughs> um, anyhow, so I was excited to be able to use my writing um, skills and my research skills um, to write this blog. And I'm very conscious of how I write and the word it, the words that I use to talk about these topics. Um, so, okay, uh, let me see. So uh, I, I, as I said, I love doing this blog. Um, our marketing department posts it on Facebook and Instagram every month. And I have a pretty good readership numbers. Um, some, some months are higher than others, depending on my topic. And um, I was excited because a University of Phoenix librarian asked if my tribal sovereignty post could be linked as a learning resource for one of their courses. So, I mean, I was honored to, to be asked that. So, you know, yeah, okay. So next um, slide, please. So this here is our vertical files. Um, these are newspaper articles from about the 1970s on um, across a range of topics from, you know, archaeology, um, education, sports, different sports, water. Um, this picture of the files on the right um, is shown by Pueblo. So we have one of every Pueblo and um, the topics um, just depend on how much of each topic we have. So some might be tribal government, some might be gaming, some might be on um, water, um, it just depends. But um, one of the things we have to, um, to I, I guess we have to, we need to do more assessment of these because as I said, um, the library was run by managed and volunteers helped um, run it for a long, for so long that some of these topics aren't necessarily appropriate to have in these file cabinets. Um, and I, you know, I don't know of them until somebody comes in to do research. I had a, um, a homeschooled, there were some homeschooled middle schoolers, I believe that they had to pick a Pueblo and do a report on. And so they were so excited to come here. And, you know, we had this material for them, but one of the kids, you know, he, the folder he pulled out, it had, um, gosh, um, I think it was um, newspaper articles on um, somebody in the tribal government that um, was accused of embezzlement or something. And, you know, I mean, I know these things happen all across in every city and town and people, but, you know, that's not something <laughs> we should really be providing access to that you know, somebody can read and learn about, you know, well, this Pueblo had this happen to them, you know, that's, so there's things like that, that need to be taken out of. And we also have some federal documents in the archives room that, that, you know, can go a little too far. And I, as I said, I don't know about them until a researcher brings them to me. And this guy said, hey, I'd love to have a copy of this. It was of, um, something at Ac Laguna Pueblo, somebody had visited there and they were writing of what the dances they saw there. And I thought, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I will cannot copy this for you. So, you know, it, it's little things like that, that we need to be able to take care of and make sure that they're not used for, you know, wrong purposes or what have you. Okay, next um, picture. So this one here is our archives. The top um, left picture is looking south. And this one, this part of the archives room are what is processed and what has been done. So the second part of my student internship, um, I worked on archives and I did a preliminary um, assessment of Joe Sandoz papers. As I mentioned, he was an author and researcher. Um, so a lot of the articles he looked up and his um, 
his um, manuscripts, the drafts are in there. Um, so I, I did that. And then I did the Friends of the Cultural Center and the Friends Collection. Um, they're, um, they're, as I mentioned, they're the non-Native people. They helped a lot, helped with um, building the Cultural Center. There was a fundraising committee, uh, different committees, nominating committee, education committee that did lectures um, to the public. And I'm forgetting the other committees that they had, docent, docent training. Um, so I did their papers and oh my gosh, that must have been, I didn't count and I didn't take pictures, 30, 40 boxes of um, papers that, you know, I saw the same paper three, four, five, six times and you just, you know, find the best copy and get rid of everything else. And I got it down to, I think there's about eight of those um, archive boxes there. So um we have maps on the right side, uh, just different maps, nothing old. That That's one issue is we get a lot of questions from researchers wanting uh, materials from, especially the Pueblo Revolt. I mean, that was 1680. We don't have, <laughs> you know, part of me wants to make a joke and say, well, here are our petroglyphs. You know, that's our written <laughs> written material for that time. But they want the voice of the Pueblo people from, you know, the 1700s, 1800s, and it's just not there. So, and there's 19 Pueblos. So, you know, that's a lot of material for even, if we were to even hold that, we, it's a lot of material. So, you know, most of our stuff is contemporary. I think the oldest um, is 1970s. And um, there's, there are a few donated books that come from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. On that back um, shelf there, uh, on the picture on the left, those are the Bureau of Ethnology um, reports. And those do go back to, I think, the late 1800s. Okay, so the picture on the right with all the shelves, that is all our unprocessed material. Um, because the, the library side is kind of like the front piece of both library and archives. It's... Um, we don't have an archivist, you know, I, I had to learn how to be a librarian because that was more visible than the archives. So there's a lot of material here that hasn't been processed. We don't have deeds for. So even if we did process it, you know, we need to get permissions to be able to provide access to this material or does it go back to um, that institution if they exist you know, or the people that collected this material. So there's, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there. On the bottom left, um, those are our VHS and there's even some beta cassettes further down. Uh, we were picked um, to be part of the community archives workshop where we would learn about audiovisual materials and how to digitize them, how to take care of them, and so that, that has been really helpful. Um, we also had, um, were given funds to be able to digitize some of these items. So I was excited. I picked 20 videos. Um, the videos here are both commercial and non-commercial titles. Um, for a long time, we had a theater in the, in the basement that was part of the museum, as well as in the bookshop we used to run on a continuous loop. Um, the videos about uh, Maria uh, Martinez, who was a famous potter from San Aldefonso, and Pablita Velarde, who was um, a Santa Clara artist. Um, so one of her murals is on the wall there at the center. Um, so, so there's some of those tapes in there. Um, there's also events that happened at the Cultural Center, which is exciting to see from like the early 90s. Um, lectures that they had, meetings. Every um, April during Gathering of Nations, we have an American Indian week that for, for the whole week where we have da different dancers and arts and crafts booths and whatnot. So those tapes were in there. Th that's exciting to see. And then on the bottom right, that's our photo collection. So those we have IPCC through the years. So there's, um, you know, pictures of the 1970s before the building, um, breaking ground of the building. 
through the different editions that have um, happened to it. Um, there's also some um, Smithsonian photos. Um, we have a 1930 Bradley R. Curry photos, which are the intertribal ceremonials in um, ceremonies in Gallup. There's also a First Nation pageant photos. Uh, but the thing with the, oh, and uh, Lee Marmon, who's Laguna, a famous photographer. Um, but some of these we don't necessarily have the rights for. So like the Smithsonian. So, you know, to a point we, we can't share them. Um, okay, so next slide. So this is the project I said I was um, in before I came on as the librarian. Um, so for this oral history project, we picked um, 20 women. We tried to get one woman from each of the 19 Pueblos, but sometimes their time when they were available didn't fit our timeline and how and in, in how we needed to how quickly we needed to get things done. So we settled for um, 14 of the Pueblos are represented here. And so we settled for a range of occupations. So here we have um, um, like the lady who's the director of the Miss Indian World at Gathering of Nations. We have a tribal historic preservation officer. We have a journalist, of course, Dr. Debbie Reese and me <laughs> as the intern, library intern. We have a couple of business women, an educator, a director of education for her Pueblo, um, an artist. Um, so it was really it was it was it was really fun and um, maybe to a point emotional doing the interviews with these ladies. Um, we would try to research them as much as we could. Um, so there are maybe four questions that each one was repeat was asked that was repeated with all the other women, but the other questions came just all depended on their history, their work, what their background was. And so all of these videos are online at the um, link at the bottom. Um, so it, it was fun to learn from them. And, it, and I kind of could hear my story in a little bit of my life in each of these women um, for the different, um, you know, paths to life that they got. One of the things we um, focused on was mentorship and who they saw as their mentor and how the mentorships help get them to where they are now. Um, let's see, looking at my notes here. Um, so I, okay, yeah, I think that's it on this. Next video, um, slide please. So I, I show the door, this is right next to the photo collection because there's a sign on this door that says restricted access. The collection that you see on the right has been behind that door locked. I don't even have the key because it was, um, it uh, deals with water rights. And so the four, these four Pueblos, um, San Aldefonso, they're all um, up north. San Aldefonso, Tsuki, Pawaki, and Nambe had um, litigation about their water rights. Um, they were in dispute, and I think the and, and appeals, which the case finally settled in 2017, and the cultural center have had these records for, um, I think since the early 90s or so, and they've been moved from room to room. But as I said, they've been under lock and key. So we finally signed an agreement with the four governors, and they're going to let us, uh, meaning me. Um, process these records and make them accessible to the public, at least those records that can be accessible. Um, they've been kind of locked because um, there's information that shouldn't be shared, not just with the public, but people outside of that Pueblo. And so um, um, some of the things that might be in these records are boundary lines that, that the Pueblos don't want known. Um, there might be um, locations of sacred sites and such. And so those records will still continue to be 
kept um, restricted. Um, so we're going to provide access, um, some finding guides, and an establishment of an advisory committee so that if a researcher, because they are very aware, the four governors are very aware that these, record, that these records are going to be, there's going to be people that will really want to know what are in these records. Um, some of them are held in other places. Um, I hear there's things in here like, where they had to get Spanish um, records that had to be translated. Um, so that's in the public domain, but you know, um, you, I guess you kind of have to know where to find these. So in order to take the pressure off of me to tell people, no, you can't um, read these records, they're gonna um, create an advisory committee so that I can tell them, well, you take your case to the advisory committee, you present to them what you wanna do with these records, what you wanna access, and it's the advisory committee that will decide whether or not um, a person is um, can see these records. So I'm excited for this um, because, you know, this is what I went to school for. And, you know, this is the kind of, now, I, you know, it's, this is just what I went to school for, and this is what I want to do. So, okay, last slide, which is, I think, just my contact information. So other jobs that I've held in between those years when I wasn't at the Cultural Center uh, in 2016 or 17, I was at the Sky City Cultural Center in Haku, Haku Museum, my, my home um, cultural center. Um, and, uh, I, I was, uh, I think the museum assistant, so I didn't do too much with libraries and archives. However, I was also a consultant, um, as a student on a map project that they had, um, Arthur Bebo, who, who collected a lot of maps of, um, the land base of Acoma Pueblo. So we helped the, um, museum, um, I don't remember what his title is exactly, the museum guy. <laughs> we helped him uh, put all of those uh, maps into a database that can be searchable. Really, it's just an Excel sheet, but um, understanding what information to take off of those maps um, to help find them. And we helped with preservation um, so they can encapsulate the maps um, so that people, you know, when they touch them, um, it protects the, the integrity of the map. Um, I was also a consultant at the Pueblo of San Felipe Community Library. I helped them weed their books. Um, so at a lot of these tribal libraries here in New Mexico, there aren't degreed librarians. Um, a lot of them have decades of experience, but they don't hold a, a degree in libraries. So San Felipe, I went there and I helped them weed their collection. I did a quick lesson for them on, um, they, they use Dewey Decimal System. So what that meant, I showed them like I did with the colored tabs in the library, um, how to um, make their books more visible to, I, I helped them um, designate which were children's books, which were juvenile books, which were young adult books. And uh, gosh, what else did I do over there? I think I helped clean up their um, database a little bit. So that was fun and exciting. Uh, and in between, I'm sure I've done other minor little consulting jobs and such, or, you know, like the SAR um, collaboration guides. Um, so I think that's it. So I'm ready for questions. Brandon, is that you putting your hand Hi, up? Hi, Brandon. <laughs> Just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, for those of you who haven't read the blog yet, I encourage you to do so. When that blog came out, I distinctly remember it um, during COVID. And 
it's such a wonderful blog. It really has a lot of good content. I'm not surprised that the university in Phoenix reached out about that. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah, I was too. I said, hey, somebody recognize it you know <laughs> yeah it it takes you know time to do the research but I enjoy it so who knew I mean in high school I was like research what <laughs> you know but I, I find I like research so that's great well you sure shared a lot of information with us um I love that oral history project as well um, there's a few familiar faces on there that I recognize. Uh, oh, yeah. Paulina, yeah. You know, she was uh, really strong in Ayla, and she's retired now, so I miss her at our meetings. Yeah, so, she was my mentor for um, San Jose, for the Circle of Learning program. So she was really helpful, too. She was a good mentor to me. Oh, good. I was That, I, that was my next question. Who was your mentor? So. I'm not surprised it was Polita. She's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I miss her. Yeah, I've had quite a few mentors well, in my in my um, schooling. You know, just I think it's important. I mean, there's um, it just to go up to somebody to say, hey, you know, I see this is the work you do. You know, can I learn from you or you know, I, I've approached people just, you know, simple as when I did a presentation at ATOM, I had no idea. I was nervous about it because I thought, you know, as I said, I don't have a lot of experience in library and archives. You know, that's something I would recommend is if you're going to do this, you know, at some point, go get go into the field, go get a um, part time job or volunteer or something, because I came in just knowing nothing. So I always kind of feel, you know, a little bit nervous, like, well, what can I teach somebody who's been doing this for 10 years? And so I went and spoke to um, one of my mentors and he's like, you know, we all can learn something. And I, I find that now too, that, you know, I, I get reminded of things that, you know, I'm sure I was taught, but, you know, you can't keep everything in your head. So it's great when you can get refresher, refreshers from people. Donna, I was going to um, ask, do you want to tell the students about your study abroad that you did when you were in the MLIS? You know, we don't have much oh, time. but <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was so excited um, through the University of Wisconsin. And I always forget if it's Madison or Milwaukee. I took a um, study abroad class in the summer to Melbourne, Australia. And I mean, I have, I've been in love with Australia since I was a little girl, you know, and so I was so excited to go. We got to visit, uh, it was for archives, but we got to visit 14 different institutions, um, anywhere from a university library to uh, Bunjalaka in the um, Melbourne Museum, which is on, centered on Aboriginal um, um, people, um, Koori, um, heritage, which is also another um, indigenous um, Aboriginal institution, to uh, what else did we go? Gay and lesbian archives, um, Melbourne Cricket Ground, which um, they play cricket down there. We went there to a sporting place um, with just 14. Oh, a hospital, the Royal Children's Hospital. So it was really nice to see the different ways. Um, because I think here in Albuquerque, we could probably do something like that too, but I had never thought of that, that all the different types of archive places that you could go and see and work at. So it was so wonderful to go, to go do that. And if you ever get a chance to do something like that, do it. Well, that's great. Jenna, we thank you so much. You shared so much information tonight and we all learned something from you. Awesome. Happy to be here. Well, we appreciate it. So students, please send questions and we can keep everyone connected. And until next time, I hope you are enjoying your studies and we'll see you again soon. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Take care.